Welcome to Interactive Storytelling. This is our third and final tour to the history of interactive storytelling. This time our focus is on video games. I have to stress again that this won't be a comprehensive review of video games supporting interactive stories. Many, if not all, video games include a story of some sort. Often they provide a background to the gameplay. Sometimes there's a linear narrative that follows the game events and gets revealed in cutscenes during the gameplay. And then there's games that allow the player to choose their path inside the story more freely and even allow the player to affect how the story is being told. These are the ones that we'll try to chart this time. Interactive fiction covers adventure games played on a computer. Originally, they included no graphics, but only text, which was understandable thinking of the resources available in early microcomputers. The first work of interactive fiction is Colossal Cave Adventure, created by Will Crowther in the mid-1970s. The game provides a textual description of the place and situation where the player is. The player can then enter a textual command of what they want to do. This command can be, for instance, go north, or look, or get lamp, or throw axe at dwarf. The game then passes the player's command and updates the game state accordingly, and then displays a textual description of the new situation. Colossal Cave Adventure inspired many to create their own text adventure games, of which the most famous is Sorg, by Matt Blanc and Dave Lepling, released in 1977. Blanc and Lepling went on to found the company Infocom, which released several highly popular text adventures in the early 1980s. Another pair inspired by Colossal Cave Adventure were Roberta and Ken Williams, whose Sierra Online took advantage of the improved graphical capabilities of the home computers in the mid-1980s. They also added graphical user interface to assist and partly replace the textual input. Sierra Online's roster of games include titles like the King's Quest series, the Space Quest series, the Police Quest series, and the Leisure Suit Larry series. Toward the turn of the 1990s, the emphasis on graphics continued with adventure games developed by LucasArts Games, uh, called later Lucas Games, starting from Maniac Mansion in 1987. Their user interface didn't include any more the possibility to input text, but the player could select the desired action from a list of verbs and an inventory of objects. Because of this, the genre got renamed as point-and-click adventures. The list of verbs reduced from title to title during the 1990s until it included the trio of hand, eye and mouth. Depending on the context, the hand indicated actions like use, pick up or open, the eye examine or read, and the mouth eat or talk. The strife for graphical represent representation culminated in the Mist series, which utilized the CD-ROM to offer pre-rendered animation and voiceovers. Also, all player interaction was included in the game world itself, and there was no need for any additional user interface overlay, as in the earlier point-and-click adventures. During the late 1990s and early 2000s, interactive fiction as well as point-and-click adventure vanished from the limelight and remained in the hands of the hobbyists. The commercial resurrection happened in the early to, uh, 2010s when Telltale Games started publishing point-and-click games for mobile devices. The breakthrough title was The Walking Dead 
released in 2012. In addition to bringing point-and-click adventures back to the mainstream, especially The Walking Dead is interesting because it allows the player to have some agency when solving moral dilemmas. Apart from Myst, the advent of CD-ROM in the 1990s brought about video games that were sometimes marketed under the moniker Interactive Cinema. For example, the video game Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective by Icom Simulations from 1991 is based on a game book of the same name. CD-ROM allowed it to use full motion video with live actors to dramatize the action. Jordan Mechner's The Last Express from 1997 is an adventure game that takes place on the Orient Express, days before the start of World War I. It attempts to simulate speeded up real-time events and includes 30 characters. The player is among them and gets entangled on the events taking place on the train. The structure of the game was unique for the time because its story is non-linear and the player's actions and failures affect the outcome. The third example of CD-ROM empowered video games is Blade Runner by Westwood Studios, released also in 1997. In the game, the player controls Ray McCoy, who is a Blade Runner chasing replicants in the original movie settings. The game also includes voiceovers from many of the original Blade Runner movie actors. The story has 13 different endings, and the player's decisions during the game determine which one gets selected. During the last 15 years, the most prophetic developer for video games, including elements from interactive storytelling, has been Quantic Dreams. Among their roster are games such as Fahrenheit, also known as Indigo Prophecy from 2005, Heavy Rain from 2010, Beyond Two Souls from 2013, and Detroit Become Human from 2018. The founder and lead game designer of Quantic Dreams, David Cage, has argued strongly for maturation of video games to expand their range of expression and themes. However laudable Cage's and Quantic Dream's aspirations are, much of the interest in development during the 2010s didn't take place in big-budget productions, but among small and independent releases. One such release is Davy Radin's The Stanley Parable. The game idea is simple. The player's avatar, Stanley, has to explore an empty office building after his computer has broken down. The player can move around freely and influence the surroundings within the confines of the game world. The twist is that the story is presented using a voiceover which suggests where Stanley should go next and comments on his decisions. Regardless of the voiceover, the player is completely free to disregard and make Stanley to do whatever they want. If this setup reminds you of the film Stranger Than Fiction that I mentioned earlier, you get an extra point. There is similarity which gets even stronger when you are playing the game. Please. Hold on to that thought, because we will come back to it later when you are ready to meet the core challenge of interactive storytelling, the narrative paradox. VoiceOver is used also in Dear Esther by the Chinese Room from 2012. Now the voiceover is however used to read letter fragments from a woman called Esther. These fragments are distributed randomly on each new game instance, which means that the story collected by the player is different during every gameplay. Again, there's an extra point being offered here. What does this setup remind you of? 
Anyone? Anyone? Yes, multicursal literature. And especially the case where we don't impose any order between the sections of the text, but allow them to be shuffled like a deck of cards. Very good, you can mark another extra point to your private I knew it bookkeeping. And just to make it clear, these points are for your private joy and they can't be transferred anything concrete for this course. Sorry. Gone Home by the Fulbright Company from 2013 also tells a story through fragments scattered in the game world. The player engages in an exploration of a mansion, but there's no specific goal that they should do. The interaction is limited to walking around and looking at the objects, which reveal part of the underlying story. From these, the player can start piecing together the story of what has happened. At the time, Gone Home got mixed reviews. While some acknowledged and lauded its autistic uh, intentions, others didn't consider it a game but called it a walking simulator. Nowadays, walking simulators have become a genre of its own, and the term has lost its derogatory origin. The mobile game 80 Days by Inkel from 2015 draws inspiration from Jules Verne's novel Around the World in 80 Days, but adding a steampunkish twist to it. Instead of faithfully following the novel, the player can make their own choices selecting the route. The generated story is affected by the events and challenges that the player faces during the travel and while staying over in the cities. Sam Barlow's Her Story from 2015 puts the player in the role of an investigator solving a case of a missing man. To do this, the player has at their disposal snippets from old police interviews of the missing man's wife. By entering search terms, the player can find out new video clips, which reveal more and more of the original story. If we look closely, her story is a walking simulator, although the player's user interface is a search engine. Whereas in Dear Esther or Gone Home, the player is navigating in a three-dimensional environment and finding bits of the story there, in her story, the environment is conceptual. It's been constructed by tagging keywords to each piece of the story, and the player navigates through it by entering new keywords. RimWorld by Ludion Studios, released in 2018, is a base building game where the basic story involves a group of space castaways stranded on a planet called RimWorld. The player commands their characters to construct a base, gather resources and fight threats such as pirate groups and native wildlife. The game features a storyteller which sets the rate and majority of random events. In the beginning, the player must choose what type of a storyteller they want to have from three alternatives. The first one, Cassandra, increases progressively the challenge level of the enemies and other threats entering the game. The second one, Phoebe, keeps long calm breaks between massive occurrences. And the third one, Randy, can initiate random challenges at any time. Our last example is 12 minutes by Louis Antonio, which should be released later this year. The idea of the game is that the player has to play through the same events repeatedly in 12 minute intervals. In each repeat, the player learns more about the game world and its characters, which in turn helps them to find the way out of the loop. If this sounds somehow familiar, the premise resembles the movie Groundhog Day that I mentioned earlier. Although the time is stuck in a loop, 
the main character's knowledge isn't. Even if you can't proceed temporarily, it's possible to progress epistemically. This concludes our review of how interactive stories have been told in video games. This list is by no means comprehensive, but aims at pointing out different approaches that game designers have taken. As we can see, the game industry has been quite active in testing out ideas and pushing the envelope to provide new narrative experiences to the audience. This also concludes the first set of videos for this course. In the next set, we will look at the theoretical background of interactive storytelling. Yes, I know, it will be another tour into history, but it will give you the tools and terms with which you can then continue forward. And I can promise that there will be some pretty neat ideas and observations ahead. It will be worth your while. See you there.